All right. Hello, everybody. I am Judy Maddox. I'm chair of our Western North Carolina Sierra Club, which is also called Winoka. It is so wonderful to have everybody here tonight. Do you know we have had over 190 people register for our program tonight? That is incredible, and thank you. I welcome you to our first online monthly meeting and also welcome folks from around the state who are concerned about our Nantahala Pisgah Forest. And as you know, we are all taking safety precautions to protect against the COVID-19 virus. Tonight, we as Winoka are supported by our North Carolina State Chapter Sierra Club with the Zoom platform. Let me see here if I can pull this up. So, our Western North Carolina Sierra Club has a Facebook, a meetup, a website to keep you informed. The North Carolina State Chapter Club also has a website and you can follow us on uh, typing in Sierra Club North Carolina. Uh, which will update you on our priorities and our actions and our alerts. These are our top three priorities. As you can see, climate change, in particular, the governor's executive order 80. Number two, ready for 100. This is a program which helps cities and counties around the state to endorse 100% renewable energy resolutions and actions as our very own Buncombe County and Asheville City have already done. And of course, what we're talking about tonight, our Pisgah Nantahala Forest Revision Plan, and we encourage you to follow both the Winoka website and the Chapter Sierra Club uh, North Carolina website for both activities. I want to invite you to our next online meeting, which will be the first Thursday of the month that has been our procedure for years, and this will be May 7th. And this program will be a fun program. This will be Wildflowers of Western North Carolina, educational and presented by naturalist and storyteller, Scott Dean. Please go to our website, again, Sierra Club Western North Carolina to register and click the link. The link is already up and waiting for you. We are inviting all of you who are not in Winoka across North Carolina to, to join us. Uh, those of you who love wildflowers and you love the mountains, uh, we are already up and running. We are also asking your help tonight to create comments regarding the Duke rate hike uh, requests. Uh, we have a, um, a posting on our Winoka website with talking points. We'd like you to submit a comment, an email to the North Carolina Public Utilities Commission. Um, they uh, are trying to figure out what to do with Duke Energy Progress requests for a 14.3% rate increase in everybody's monthly residential bills. Um, and Duke Progress has not included any plans in this amount of money for renewable energy. So we would like you to do uh, these things. One, say no. Number two, say no to investments in fossil fuels and having to pay for coal ash. And number three, to demand uh, planning for renewable energy before any kind of uh, recovery of costs uh, can be allocated. For tonight's program, uh, I'd like to point out to you that you can text your questions by using the email button, which is down at the very bottom, the base of your screen. And our pre presenters, after each one, we will have three presenters I'll introduce in just a second, each one of them will take an opportunity to answer maybe two, maybe three questions at the end of their presentation. But again, at the end of the whole program, 
uh, there can be a panel, all of them can answer. Our timing for tonight, the presentation will be roughly an hour. And at the end of that hour, we will have questions and answers that will go hopefully ending in about 15 minutes. So we should be completely done uh, by 8.30. The purpose of tonight's program, as I'm sure you're very aware, is to educate you on uh, the force, the Pisgah and Nantahala revision plan, so that you will be able to write comments to the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, at the end of the program, we will direct you to go to our website where we have an add up program, a link that will help you with talking points. You don't need to take notes tonight. Uh, this presentation is being mm -hmm. live broadcast by uh, Facebook, the North Carolina Facebook, and will be um, online uh, if you would like. So let me introduce uh, the three presenters. Sam Evans is senior attorney and leader of Southern Environmental Law's National Forest and Parks Program in the Asheville office. Josh Kelly is public lands field biologist for Mountain True. David Reed is vice chair and forest issues chair of the North Carolina chapter of the Sierra Club. And thank you, thank you for your participation. Thanks, Judy. And uh, a, as a clarification to where we're hoping to get questions, there are actually two buttons at the bottom of your screen. One says chat and one says Q&A. And if you've got questions for the panelists tonight, please use the Q&A function. Um, that way we can kind of track, keep track better of which questions have been answered and which ones haven't. Um, so. Thanks a lot, everybody, for your interest in being here. Um, I think we should dive right in. I'm going to get us started with a presentation about uh, what forest planning is and, and why we do it. Um, so here we go. So it's always a challenge to know where to begin with uh, a presentation like this because I'm sure that many of you have some experience with forest planning uh, and some of you probably don't. So let's start at the beginning, which is the creation of the federal public lands system that we enjoy today. And so what were the lands that Teddy Roosevelt was talking about that he told us that we should cherish and protect? Well, there are a lot of them. So 28% of land in the US is owned and managed by the federal government. We're very lucky in North Carolina to have a relatively high percentage uh, for Eastern states. In fact, we have the second highest percentage of, of any state in the East. Uh, a lot of those lands, most of them are in our backyard. Uh, and there are a lot of different kinds of federal public lands. We have the Park Service uh, managed lands like the Smokies and the Parkway. But the ones we're gonna be talking about tonight Forests, and those are managed by the Forest Service. So the Forest Service manages almost 200 million acres across the country. A little over a million of those acres are here in Western North Carolina. And when the Forest Service decides what to do with these lands, they're using the framework of multiple use and sustained yield. And uh, what that means in the, in the words of the Forest Service's first chief is the greatest good of the greatest number in the long run. And just to unpack that really quickly, in the long run, uh, sustainability is built in this concept from the beginning. Um, of the greatest number, that means that we want as many people supporting public lands as possible. Uh, we want a big tent of support for public lands. And the greatest good, well, that just means that we have to work really hard uh, to come up with efficient solutions for, uh, for conflicts on our public lands because we want to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms. So because of this concept, you'll often hear national forests called the lands of many uses. 
And the statutorily protected or enumerated multiple uses include outdoor recreation. And that runs the spectrum of everything you see here and more. Uh, timber and forest products. Uh, forest products is much bigger category than just logs. Uh, a couple of these springtime pictures. I know I wish I was spending more time in the forest right now looking for ramps um, and, and mushrooms, but uh, such is life. Maybe next spring. Uh, watershed, this is a really important one for our Eastern National Forest. Uh, our lands were really hammered hard by, uh, by industrial logging at the turn of the 20th century when, uh, when they were in private hands. Uh, it, protecting these watersheds is one of the primary reasons that there was enough political will to acquire the Eastern National Forest and make them part of our federal public lands. Wildlife and fish, this is where the rubber meets the road. If we're doing a good job of, of managing our national forest, we're going to make room for all the critters that depend on them. And last but not least, wilderness, which has a lot of overlap with some of these other issues like recreation, uh, watershed protection, and wildlife. So some of these goals, as you might intuit, can be in tension at times. Uh, it's hard to have wilderness and timber harvest in the same places, but the Forest Service's job is to make them all fit together. How do we do that? And this is where we're gonna start our forest planning speed run. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to try to, to download to you as much information as you can stand about, uh, about forest planning. So let's start with the law, the National Forest Management Act, NIFMA. This uh, requires that the Forest Service develop a management plan and coordinate the multiple uses. Uh, management plans, forest plans, don't, uh, don't determine actions. They don't get you all the way to the ground. That happens with projects. So projects uh, have to be consistent with the plan. So you, set a, you have a set of broad rules in the plan which uh, help you design your projects, which, uh, which are actions on the ground. So a forest plan at the most general level uh, expresses the values that we're going to promote or protect in each general area of the forest. So is an area going to be wilderness? Is it going to be managed for timber production? Those kind of basic questions uh, are answered by the forest plan. So for each general area, you're going to have goals and desired conditions that set a compass bearing for the area. What direction should it be headed? How should it look in the long term? whether or not we think we can get there in the next 15 years. Objectives set the pace that we're going to make toward those desired conditions. And then standards and guidelines are the rules that would protect other values in those areas. So if you have an objective for, uh, for, for a certain amount of timber harvest in an area, uh, you might want rules that would protect water quality while you're doing timber harvest. So, after the planning stage, you have projects. And what is a project? Well, a project says exactly where things happen. So within a general area, um, if it's an area that allows timber harvest, projects determine which trees get cut. And if it's an area where we're trying to decrease road density, which roads will be closed? One really important concept, and I hope this doesn't seem too wonky, uh, but we're gonna, it's gonna be important later, is that these project level questions, deciding where to do things, can be really hard or pretty easy depending on how detailed the forest plan is. So here we go. This is the Forest Service decision making funnel. And at the top, the broadest level, you have the multiple use mandate. And this is just the requirement that the Forest Service balances all these competing and very different uses. At the bottom, you have action. Trees are cut, trails are open, roads are closed. All those kinds of concrete actions happen at the bottom of the funnel. Plans get you part way there. Projects get you the rest of the way there. The blue area on this slide sort of represents how much work is that. So you could have a plan that, uh, that doesn't make many decisions and leaves a lot of flexibility to the project level. But with that flexibility comes a lot of potential for harm and a lot of uh, effort is required. So planning the project, um, developing the project and making sure it has the right sideboards around it, collaborating with the public, all that work 
increases with a plan that doesn't make many decisions. And the opposite is true too. If your plan gets you closer to the ground, projects become a lot easier. Um, there's a lot less potential for harm and therefore a lot less need for uh, really complicated project development processes. So one of the central questions in forest planning is flexibility versus certainty. And we're gonna come back around to this idea, but put a pin in it for now. Okay, so after you have a forest plan and after you're implementing it through projects, what else does NIFMA require? Well, you're gonna monitor the results and revise the plan uh, whenever you need to, but at least every 15 years or so, uh, resources permitting, and our plan has been around since 1994, so we're a little bit late. But this is the stage we're at right now. We've had a plan since 94. We've been implementing it through projects. We've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't work. Our current plan is plagued with conflict and, uh, and harms to things like old growth and natural areas. Uh, so we know a lot about how, um, how the plan needs to change. Uh, not everything needs to change about the plan. Some things are working well and won't need to change. Uh, other things will need to change because they're not working so well, because they're conflicts that come up again and again. And there is also a need to change the plan because of a new planning rule. So the 2012 planning rule it requires at the top, number one priority, ecological sustainability. And what that means is that we measure our success uh, by how, what the forest would look like if we hadn't messed it up in the first place. So that's our baseline and what we're trying to move toward. Uh, to the extent compatible with those ecological goals, the plan has to contribute to social and economic sustainability. So uh, not only are we trying to meet natural values, we're trying to meet human needs too. And the planning rule encourages collaboration. And this is really important. Every one of your panelists tonight, SELC, Mountain True, and the club, have been involved with a couple of uh, collaborative groups, the Stakeholders Forum and the Partnership. Um, collaborative groups are, uh, are, are where diverse interests get together to try to answer that question that Gifford Pinchot uh, po posed at the outset of the Forest Service. How can we do the greatest good for the greatest number? Um, so we want to be efficient. We don't want to have conflicts that are unnecessary. And so the way we've talked about this is moving from zero sum to win-win. Uh, it's important that we all remember this when we're drafting comments organizationally and individually, that it's, it's about what we want, what we value and need to see on the national forest uh, and, and trying to avoid unnecessary, unnecessarily saying we're against things. So that's what collaboration uh, is designed to do. Uh, and, and I think, the, the draft plan really reflects a lot of the input from those collaborative groups in a really positive way. So that's forest planning in a nutshell. And now let's get to our forest plan process and where we're at in it. So uh, we are at what is called the 90 day comment period, which is gonna be a bit longer because of coronavirus related delays. This sort of happens near the end of forest planning and it's a really important stage. It's, it's really the forest, it's the public's first chance to see a holistic vision from the Forest Service for how we're gonna manage the forest for the next 20 more years. Um, and it's also the last chance. So uh, the last chance that's formally required before the plan is finalized um, for, the, for the public to be able to weigh in. So what does the draft look like? Well, this is from me um, and others may have different perspectives on it, but I think the plan has a lot of good stuff. It's innovative. It builds on collaboration and partnerships and it creates a vision that requires everyone to keep working together. And those are all really positive because they help us support that big tent for, uh, for public lands, that, uh, that sort of unified public um, support for, for the federal estate, which keeps public lands in public hands. Um, I think there are some, um, some shortfalls in, in the draft. I think that the priorities and the sideboards aren't clear enough or strong enough. And I, uh, I expect that Josh uh, might get into some of the issues with uh, the plan that may need clarification 
or strengthening in his portion of the presentation. But when you look at the draft, you're going to see a couple things. You're going to see a plan and you're going to see alternatives. So let's talk about the plan. The plan provides guidance and rules at different scales. So there are some rules that apply all across the forest. There are some rules or some goals that apply at the geographic area scale. And this is really broad scale planning. So it just recognizes that you know, the Pisgah district with a lot of mountain bike use is different from the Black Mountains, which has a ton of hiking and wilderness and, uh, and, and those kinds of uses. So eco zones uh, are another uh, set of areas that have slightly different desired conditions, um, actually fundamentally different desired conditions based on the ecological needs of these different forest communities. The one uh, the type of management difference that matters most uh, is in, between the alternatives is in the management areas. So management areas are, are a little bit more fine scale, but they're, they're polygons on the ground on maps that will, uh, that will determine how those places are managed in the future. So the matrix management area is a place where we're going to see the most, uh, it, we're going to see the most timber production. Uh, the most uh, scheduled timber harvest. Backcountry areas kind of at the other end of things are places where we're gonna see very little timber harvest and road construction. And there are some other uh, management areas worth noting like the ecological interest area. That one uh, is, allows timber harvest, but only for some specified reasons like improving species composition. And so it's a good way uh, to meet needs for timber harvest uh, while still being sensitive to ecological values. You're also going to see the draft alternatives. So draft alternatives are really just different maps. They're different configurations of these same management areas. Um, so in alternative A, that's the current plan, um, that uh, is, it's not likely to be carried forward. So I wouldn't pay too much attention to it. But alternatives B, C, and D are really where the action is. So alternative B, I told you we were going to return to this idea of flexibility and certainty. But alternative B is the most flexibility alternative. And that means it also has the most potential for project level harm. Uh, there's the, the, the fewest restrictions or strings attached to timber, scheduled timber harvest. Um, this also has the most recommended wilderness. Alternative C has the most certainty. So that means it has the most strings attached to timber harvest in the most places. Uh, still quite a bit of flexibility. Um, and it has the least potential for project level harm. It actually protects a lot of values like old growth and natural heritage areas the best. It, but uh, on the other hand, it has the least recommended wilderness. There's another alternative that's, uh, that's kind of poised in the middle between those two, but in reality, it's very close to alternative B as far as the acreage of, of, um, of the landscape that, is, um, that has sort of no strings attached. If you want to see how those look in a zoomed in landscape, here's one that you might, uh, some of you might know pretty well. This is Big Ivy. Alternatives B, C, and D have very different management of Big Ivy. Uh, and you can see these kind of, these big, big picture choices playing out at the smaller scale. So alternative B has the most area in timber production, but also the most recommended wilderness in Big Ivy. Uh, alternative C has actually zero timber production, but it does allow ecological restoration, timber harvest, and it has the smallest recommended wilderness. Alternative D is a bit of a mix. It has a slightly expanded recommended wilderness area, uh, a mixture of ecological restoration and uh, timber production. So uh, if you add up, aggregate all of those choices in specific places uh, at the whole plan level, you get something like this. So um, at my color coding uh, attempt here is just to show sort of which, which alternatives I think do the best or the worst at different things. And so you'll see it's a mixed bag. There's not one line that's all green or all red. Um, and so this might leave you wondering which alternative you should be voting for. And I will stop you right there because it's not a voting contest. Uh, specific and concrete comments with reasons why you would like the Forest Service to make changes, that's what's going to be useful. So we want to help you focus on the issues and places that matter to you. And so 
uh, for the remainder of the presentation. And then afterwards, if, if uh, and in Q&A, uh, we're here to help you understand how the draft affects the things that matter to you. And with that, I'm going to toss it to Josh. Um, before Sam tosses it to me, I would like to open up if anybody has any clarifying questions for Sam um, about that segment of the presentation. That's going to be your policy heavy portion of the, of the presentation. And this is your chance. Looks like we do have one question that came in. And the question is, I am still a little confused regarding the logic behind of how having greater recommended wilderness allows for more timber and thus less ecological restoration. Wouldn't more wilderness being left alone allow for more ecological diversity? So a couple of questions to unpack in that one. So uh, can you have more recommended wilderness plus a bigger landscape where you have timber production being allowed at the same time? And the, and the answer to that is yes, um, as compared to the current plan. The Forest Service actually uh, tackled this question directly in the draft EIS, and um, they've explained pretty clearly that those areas that are being recommended for wilderness are not areas that were gonna be ever on the table for timber production. So there's not really a trade-off between those two things. I think that's actually really positive. Um, that the Forest Service has let the public know that we can have more wilderness without interfering with the economic uses that often um, are threatened by more wilderness. So, you know, and, and I, th I think the conversation a lot of times pretty quickly when you talk about wilderness designation um, turns to fear and people are worried that that's going to foreclose economic options in the future. And the Forest Service has told us really clearly that, nope, it's done the math and that's not true. Great answer, Sam. Any other questions before I start my portion of the presentation? Okay, yeah, that was a really good question. All right, let me cue up my screen here. And while I do, um, I'd like to really thank um, David and Judy and the whole Sierra Club for um, for inviting Sam and I to be part of this presentation. It's really great to get a chance to talk to folks from a, a, a larger pool than just our own organizations. Um, also, I'm going to note that um, if you'd like to hear more of what I have to say, I'm going to be doing another webinar for Mountain True next Tuesday, April 2nd at 5.30 p.m. And you can go on the Mountain True website. If you just search for Mountain True, you can find our website and find our events and should be easily able to sign up for that um, event if you'd like to hear more. That will go a little bit more into, into some of the nitty gritty uh, of a couple issues I don't have time for tonight. Um, David has asked me to cover some of the main conservation objectives for the new forest plan. So he's asked me to cover recommendations for new wilderness and protective management for wilderness inventory areas uh, that are not recommended for wilderness, uh, protection of existing old growth, and uh, planning for future old growth, and protection of North Carolina uh, Natural Heritage Program natural areas that occur on Forest Service lands. Also gonna talk a little bit about some other conservation objectives, not, not in very much detail at all. Um, I'll talk a little bit about timber harvest. I'm really not gonna talk much about road systems and recreation. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about restoration. Um, just don't have uh, quite enough time to get into all of these topics, but the, the bottom line is that all of us who really care about conservation really want all of these activities to be sustainable and to, to leave the land better than we found it in the long run. When talking about wilderness, I think it's good to consider all the congressional designations that are available to us, and that includes designated wilderness areas that are designated under the Wilderness Act and require an act of Congress. It also includes on our forest several wilderness study areas that have been designated since 1984, and it includes wild and scenic rivers. On our forest, we have two designated wild and scenic rivers, the Horse Pasture in Transylvania County, which was uh, really championed by Sierra Club leader Bill Thomas, and uh, Wilson Creek Wild and Scenic River in Caldwell County, uh, primarily. Um, both fantastic streams. There are a lot of other uh, eligible streams for designation on the Nantahala Pisgah, and we, we have a lot of great water resources. When it comes to existing wilderness, we haven't had any designated in North Carolina since 1984. 
we had one of the very first wilderness areas that were, was uh, designated in 1964, that's Linville Gorge. Back in 1964, wilderness areas were perceived to have to be in a pristine state and very little, having been very little altered by the activities of humans. Uh, in 1975, that was clarified to say that wilderness areas can actually recover from human activities. And at that time, Shining Rock, Ellicott Rock, and Joyce Kilmer Slick Rock were designated. And in 1984, you had Middle Prong and Southern Nantahala designated as part of the uh, North Carolina Wilderness Act. Also in 1984, as part of that same act, there were five wilderness study areas that were designated. Uh, these are kind of unique because generally wilderness study areas are uh, a recommendation by the Forest Service. This, this terminology, wilderness study areas, most, most commonly refers to recommendations by the Forest Service uh, to Congress to designate areas. But in 1984, these five areas were designated largely on the efforts of the Sierra Club in North Carolina, as a matter of fact, um, to a, kind of a semi-permanent status of wilderness studies. So that's Lost Cove and Harper Creek, which are in the Wilson Creek watershed, the Craggy Mountain uh, area, which is in Big Ivy, and Overflow in Macon County and Snowbird in Graham County, all fabulous areas that have sort of been sitting in limbo since 1984, sort of a permanent limbo, because it would actually take an act of Congress to change their designation. So here's uh, kind of a zoomed out map of where these areas are. The areas in um, red are designated wilderness and the areas in blue are congressionally designated wilderness study areas. And you can see how they're stretched across the state. There's also some green outlined areas that are wilderness areas in other states like Virginia, Tennessee, and Georgia that show up on this map. So the Sierra Club has pretty specific recommendations for new wilderness in, in the uh, forest plan. I'm gonna couch this in saying that on a couple of these areas, Mountain True has remained agnostic and we would like to see these permanently protected, but we don't necessarily think that has to be in the form of wilderness. But as far as the Sierra Club is concerned, um, they're asking for all the wilderness study areas from the 1984 wilderness bill be protected. Um, many extensions to existing wilderness areas to be added uh, and the very best new areas from the 2015 wilderness inventory that the Forest Service did. And that 2015 wilderness inventory selected um, based on the character of the areas and lack of road density, about 350,000 acres of the Nantahala Pisgah. You know, we're fortunate to have one of the most rugged and remote national forests in the Eastern United States and to have about 35% of those lands show up in a wilderness inventory is a testament to that. Now, not all of those are really great wilderness candidates, but there are a number that are. And so the very best of those that uh, the club and others are uh, proposing for new recommended wilderness in this forest plan. So those new areas that have shown up in the forest plan include the Black Mountains. This includes Mount Mitchell and Silo Knob and a pretty broad swath of the, the Black Mountains, the highest mountain chain in the east. Mackey Mountain, which was part of the very first purchase of National Forest in 1912 under the Weeks Act in McDowell County. Tesquitty Bald, which would be the largest potential new wilderness. Uh, some versions of this wilderness area are in excess of 16,000 acres. Um, the Unicoi Mountains in Cherokee County, which back up to the new Upper Bald River Wilderness in Tennessee. And then there's a couple of areas that are, have been recommended potentially by the Forest Service in Alternative B that um, have not been specifically endorsed by the club or, or necessarily uh, any of the other uh, broad collaborative groups, but are out there potentially. And that's Lesser Bald in uh, Macon and Swain County, and then the Bald Mountains in Madison County. Both of those areas are traversed by the Appalachian Trail. A lot of extensions, basically, if there's an existing wilderness, there's a potential ex extension to it. Any roadless area that is adjacent to an existing wilderness area is eligible, potentially, and that includes Joyce Kilmer Slick Rock, uh, several additions to Southern Nantahala. I think Southern Nantahala has at least uh, 7,000 acres of potential wilderness additions. Um, interestingly, the, the original Southern Nantahala wilderness proposal was for 40,000 acres and um, only 29,000 acres, I believe, were in, eventually designated, but the rest of those acres are still out there in pretty good condition and could be uh, designated at some point. Small addition to Ellicott Rock, um, 1,700 acre addition to Middle Prong, a couple of small additions to Shining Rock and a small addition to Linville Gorge are all possibilities in this forest plan. 
So those potential wilderness areas I was talking about that in the wilderness inventory, they were about 350,000 acres. Um, you know, at a maximum, 124,000 acres of those areas could be recommended as wilderness and alternative B. Um, the remainder, uh, I believe, and I think the Sierra Club believes, should be allocated to the backcountry management area or other unsuitable management areas like ecological interest areas. So that, that terminology of suitable versus unsuitable is something that comes up a lot in forest planning and management areas. The definition of a suitable management area is a management area that has as its primary or secondary use timber production. Uh, whereas unsuitable management areas, management can still happen, even tree cutting can still happen, but timber production is not a primary or secondary purpose for that uh, timber cutting. It's most likely going to be more of an ecological restoration kind of use. And there's a lot of talk of timber harvest as a tool for ecological restoration in uh, the draft forest plan. The ecological interest area management area is probably the primary area where uh, ecological restoration may happen in this plan uh, because it really is uh, worded a lot towards that, towards restoring the species composition of forest ecosystems. When you're looking at the various alternatives and how they handle those wilderness inventory areas, there's a really big difference. Um, in alternative B, 106,000 acres are allocated to matrix and interface management areas that are suitable for timber production. Whereas in alternative C, you have 8,900 acre, uh, 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 acres, which is, is not a, a whole heck of a lot. You know, so the alternative C really nets the vast majority of those wilderness inventory areas. Whereas alternative D is actually the worst for the wilderness inventory areas at 112,000 acres ending up in matrix and interface. The worst if you'd like to see those areas stay out of timber production. If you'd like them to be in timber production, it may perhaps be the best alternative. Just depends on your perspective. Another big issue with this uh, forest plan is old growth forest, which is one of the most underrepresented uh, conditions on the forest. And old growth forests are, are characterized by uh, trees of uh, advanced age, uh, lack of significant human disturbance, uh, diverse tr structures like standing dead trees and down trees, multi-layered canopies, canopy gaps, uh, generally diverse species composition depending oftentimes on the forest type, and uh, diversity and diameter heights, um, and good wildlife hab habitat gen generally because of the complexity found in those forests. So we're talking about with lack of human disturbance when I'm evaluating an old growth forest, uh, like large uncut chestnut stumps like this one are a very good sign that you are probably in an old growth forest and just a lack of tree stumps in general, lack of logging roads. Um, a mixed age canopy is a really good thing. So uh, short trees, tall trees, uh, fat trees, skinny trees uh, are all good examples. This particular spot uh, on the side of Wyabald in Macon County, uh, you can see my, my friend Dan Entmacher there, he was coring that poplar. It ended up having 304 rings on that course. Those are 300 year old trees, some of those in that picture. And all the old trees um, in old growth forest should probably be uh, documented with the use of an increment bore, which is just a hollow drill that you can pull a core out of and count the rings. Um, that particular white oak was over 280 years when I cored it about 15 years ago. You know, large trees are, are oftentimes old, uh, but not always. On the other hand, small trees can also be equally as old. So this old gnarly chestnut oak might only be 16 inches in diameter, but it's probably just as old as that white oak you just saw. Uh, snags are standing dead trees and they provide pretty unique structures. Uh, a lot of hollows for birds to nest in, things like that. Um, and uh, this particular snag has a rhododendron growing out of it, like uh, 80 feet up in the air in the uh, Middle Creek Research Natural Area in the Black Mountains, which is one of the premier old growth sites on Pisgah National Forest. Tree fall gaps occur when individual or multiple trees fall, either due to old age or a storm. Um, and they create openings in the forest that lead to a lot of diversity. And those openings can vary in size. Uh, different species have different light requirements. So large openings will create a high light environment that's good for species that need a lot of light, whereas uh, smaller openings uh, provide sort of an intermediate environment that are, can be good for a certain uh, species of trees and herbs to regenerate in. And when those trees fall, they create downwoody debris. And those are just huge sources of habitat for things like salamanders and insects, great places for growth of plant life and really help to rebuild the soil. And this is something that I think uh, is really relevant to our philosophy on life is that 
to remember that um, that all those that have come before us are feeding the life that, that we are able to enjoy now. And that you see that in an old growth forest right in front of your eyes. Uh, pit and mound formation is just another thing that happens when trees fall. Uh, they tip up the root ball and it creates a mound and behind that's a pit. These are spots for colonization. Uh, for species to, to enjoy. So old growth forests are important for a lot of reasons, not just because they're underrepresented, but they're, they're very important. There's a lot of species that are specialized on those kind of conditions. Um, the forest plan documents, uh, and particularly in the draft environmental impact statement and in the need for change document, uh, documents that between 420,000 and 550,000 acres of Nantahala Pisgah should be in the old growth stage of development under natural conditions with all of the natural processes operating. Unfortunately, there's no alternative in this forest plan that designates more than 256,000 acres to old growth management. Um, we believe that there should be at least 420,000 acres designated to that management so that we have a chance of reaching that goal and also so that there's better tracking and monitoring of how much old growth is actually occurring on the landscape. Um, alternative C is notable. It's a positive in that it places all known old growth into old growth management. So all of the old growth that we know about on the forest, over 90,000 acres actually ends up in an old growth patch in alternative C. So that's a positive thing. Um, the problem of a lack of old growth designation could pretty easily be uh, solved by bringing all the designated wilderness and recommended wilderness, all the backcountry special interest areas and Appalachian Trail management areas into the designated old growth network. Um, it's not like there aren't lands out there that are basically being managed for older forest. Uh, to designate those and to track the condition of those lands would really help us uh, make progress towards the goal of bringing the forest into the natural range of variation. Um, so in addition to a patch network, there needs to be clear standards and guidelines for identifying and protecting existing old growth forests during forestry projects. So the alternative C, as I mentioned, does protect all the existing old growth forests, but we don't know where all the old growth forest is, at least not collectively. There are probably individuals who might know where a lot of it is. Um, the other problem is not everyone recognizes old growth forest, so there needs to be a process that foresters or other technicians with the Forest Service when they're out developing projects use to identify old growth forest. Um, so for an example, this, the, the plan could easily say, all stands considered for timber harvest will be evaluated for the maximum age of trees in the stand and other old growth characteristics. Any stands found, found to meet the region eight guidance for old growth will not be regenerated. Um, and regeneration harvest is the process of basically taking older forest and making younger forest through cutting trees. Um, the region eight guidance is the southern region of the Forest Service's guidance for managing and identifying old growth forest. So there's guidance out there. Um, the plan could address this and, and should. And um, so um, hopefully this is something that can change between the draft and the final. Uh, Another really important conservation target for the forest plan are the natural heritage natural areas. These are identified by the uh, North Carolina Natural Heritage Program. They're identified because they contain the very best and rarest elements of natural diversity in North Carolina. And they usually have not only uh, outstanding examples of natural communities, but also rare species. Uh, and extra credit if anyone in the chat can name that cute little owl and that cute little wildflower uh, on the left and right of this uh, this slide. That's, the, that's a fun little project for you all uh, following along. Um, when it comes to North Carolina uh, natural heritage natural areas, there's about 228,000 acres that have been, been identified on the Nantahala and Pisgah. About 93,000 acres of exceptional areas. Uh, these, uh, the Natural Heritage Program has a, a five stage ranking with exceptional being the highest ranking. Uh, have been placed in special interest areas. Uh, many of those overlap other protective designations like wilderness or backcountry. Um, if those, you know, some areas have not been designated special interest area, but do overlap other management areas that are compatible with natural area management like wilderness, backcountry, the Rhone Mountain Management Area, the Appalachian Trail, uh, special interest area, and ecological interest areas. Um, 
But unfortunately, every alternative leaves thousands of acres of natural areas and matrix and interface that emphasize manipulation of age classes through timber harvest. And generally, unless there's been a mapping error, uh, these areas represent the healthiest and best forests uh, and other ecosystems of our region and generally don't need to heavy manipulation through timber harvest. Um, so as an example of how this breaks down, alternative B has 68,700 acres in matrix and interface management area. Alternative C does uh, about twice as good and only has 34,000 acres in matrix and interface, but still has quite a bit. And alternative D has 67,567 acres in matrix and interface management areas. So I've talked uh, quite a bit about the uh, wilderness inventory areas and the natural areas and the various acreages that show up in um, in the various alternatives. I won't go through all the alternatives. I do want to be uh, show you how it looks in, in alternative D, which is, is pitched uh, in uh, some places as being a moderate alternative and is actually the worst for these two resources in, in tandem. Um, and so you can see in this, uh, in this slide, green is just general National Forest Service land. It might be wilderness, it might be matrix, it might be all sorts of things. Uh, blue are the wilderness inventory areas identified during the planning process. And uh, D are portions of those wilderness inventory areas that show up in matrix and interface. So that, that yellow color there that is the wilderness inventory areas that um, if they go into matrix and interface, that would be potentially an incompatible management that could reduce their wild characteristics. And then in red, you see the natural areas. And a lot of those really overlap uh, a lot of those, um, those wilderness inventory areas. So this is just how that, that plays out across the landscape, those yellow and red colors that Alternative D uh, puts into what I think are incompatible management for those resources. Other conservation priorities really re revolve around ecological restoration, the active management that we can take as people to help uh, the land be as healthy as it can be. Ecological restoration involves restoring the structure, function, composition, and connectivity of ecosystems. Um, on our forests, some structures are really underrepresented, some structural classes. Young forest, open woodlands and old growth forests are all underrepresented. These conditions could be improved partially through better fire management, uh, particularly open forests. These open woodlands really require fire for their development and maintenance. And because part of our philosophy as land managers for the past hundred years has been to put out every single fire, uh, there's very little of those conditions left around. Um, Efforts to increase connectivity are especially important for all ecosystems due to climate change. And a great example of connectivity, and I'd like to uh, thank my friend uh, Damon Hearn, who used to work for Child Unlimited for this slide, uh, is in streams where we have a lot of man-made structures like perched culverts that uh, block fish and other aquatic organism migration. And by converting those into different kinds of structures where our roads need to remain in place, we can actually enhance the connectivity of headwater streams to mainstreams and help with climate change mitigation. As waters warm, cold water species can continue to move upstream in this kind of scenario. It's the same kind of scenario with terrestrial species and actually the same kind of fat fragmenting feature generally, which is roads and other human development. Um, there's a lot of language in the forest plan about restoration and a lot of implicit uh, uh, looking at timber harvest as a method for restoration. I do want to, uh, you know, just ease any concerns folks have about timber harvest as a restoration tool. It absolutely can be a restoration tool. This is an example of a timber harvest on national forest land that turned out great. There are no invasive species here. Uh, doesn't have to clear the entire canopy. It can create structure and habitat that is lacking on the forest while also restoring species composition. But uh, not every timber harvest is a restoration harvest. Uh, and so when we're doing timber harvest, we want to make sure that it's done in the places that make the most sense for it. And that's one of those decisions that the plan is able to make that Sam was talking about when you're uh, judging the difference between flexibility and certainty. Also, when thinking about uh, this forest plan and your own interest in the forest plan, I think it's important to keep in mind other stakeholders' interests. These are all valid and important parts of uh, the interest in national forests, like young forest habitat or early successional habitat for wildlife. That includes deer, turkey, rough grouse, elk, songbirds, and more. Um, you know, fo forest products, including uh, trees, including herbs, including you know all sorts of things that, that come off the forest. Uh, 
access to the forest in the firm form of open roads that people can can use to access and enjoy the forest, uh, fire and pest management, and outdoor recreation of all sorts. Um, that's all I have for my presentation. I guess I saw a lot of questions popping up on the, I thought I did anyway on the screen, and I'll see if, oh, there's no questions. I've, I'll give you a couple uh, moments to get in any questions that you'd like to get in, and after that, I will pass it on to David to wrap this presentation up. Let's see, any questions? It doesn't look like there are. Um, all right, let's pass it off to David. Let me see, I have to stop sharing my screen. All right, thank you. Thanks, Josh, and thanks, Sam. Um, I, uh, I, I've, I've left them to do the, the hard work, seemingly, and they've, they've done a great job so far. So if any questions for either one of them occur, feel free to go ahead and type those in. But I'm, I'm gonna do kind of a wrap up um, about the focus for the Sierra Club and what we're encouraging people to say um, in, in their comments during this comment period. Um, and you, you've already heard a lot of it um, explained probably better than I could explain it. But um, again, everybody, everybody should feel like they have, as, as an owner of these public lands, uh, the ability to express themselves and write comments during this 90-day comment period. And you don't need to be, um, you, you don't need to be, uh, uh, have a degree in forestry um, or, or any other of the related specialty fields, but. It, but just as a user of the forest to say what you think are, are important. So we've, we've, we've written out some talking points um, based on what, what our values are and what's close to our hearts. And I'm just gonna go through these. And I know that we've heard a lot of jargon tonight. So just sit back and just kind of uh, uh, absorb the ideas here. I don't feel like you gotta take notes or write a lot of things down because at the end of this, we're gonna have a link which takes you to a Sierra Club resource known as, as AdUp, where we've got these talking points, where you can uh, choose to submit your comments in a variety of, uh, of ways that we'll, we'll outline. So we've heard about wilderness tonight, so I'll just start with wilderness. Let me, let me uh, make this full screen for you. Um, so we did come to a decision, um, as had been alluded to, about the best of this wilderness inventory land that we thought was most deserving of wilderness recommendation in, the, in one of the collaborative groups, the partnership. So um, it's about along the lines of the acreage and, and alternative B, um, but, but includes the wilderness study areas and the extensions um, to the existing wilderness and, and the four main new wilderness um, recommendations that, that you saw Josh go over. Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to pull out and emphasize one special area that uh, many, some of you are local to Buncombe County, some of you are across the state, maybe even other states, but there is really unanimous support for um, additional protection for the craggy area, which um, as you've seen has a core area that could be recommended for wilderness, um, smaller or larger depending on the alternative but which also um, we think ought to be supported for uh, potential as a national scenic area, which is outside the scope of this forest plan, but could be addressed by Congress. Um, it has the unanimous support of Buncombe County commissioners. So I just wanted to call your attention to that. Um, many of you know it as Craggy Gardens and the Craggy area with Douglas Falls and the, and the lands to the north um, of that. It's basically, it's the, it's the ridge and lands to the west, right to the to the west of the Black Mountain Range. Um, we've heard about backcountry. Backcountry is going to be a management area in the new plan. Um, it, it is more protective from active management, although it's possible to have some active management. It's more protected than the matrix and interface. Um, and we think it's, um, we, it should be expanded in, in at least one of the alternatives. And again, we we, we've been talking about um, not voting for one of the alternatives, um, but there's been conversation about, well, can we take one of the alternatives that kind of approaches what we want? And with these, with these suggestions that we're making, make that alternative the preferred alternative from our standpoint. And, 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 we're, and, and we, 
are looking at alternative C, but we, we're also talking about the other alternatives too for their potential. But just say we're talking about alternative C, we could, um, most of the wilderness air inventory acres not recommended for wilderness um, should be put in backcountry. But we've heard from, we've heard from Josh that some of those acres will be appropriate especially if they're close to open roads and things like that and accessible for e the ecological restoration work. So we're not saying no activity um, at all could occur in there, but it, it ought to be appropriate to, to what we're trying to accomplish um, to restore the natural um, range of variation. We've, talk, we've heard about the North Carolina natural heritage areas. So here, focusing on the comments that you might make, we, we, we with those rankings, the state natural areas with the exceptional, very high and high rankings should be included in, in the backcountry management area or recommended wilderness areas or special interest areas. That would give them the highest level of, of protection. And we heard Josh say that really they, they, they really exhibit the healthy stage of, of, of forest that probably a, there's no reason to do a lot of active management in those areas. Um, and then, and then we, we, we saw Sam's um, good graphic about the funnel. And so we, we, we want a little more standards after, after our under current understanding of the, of the draft plan in the EIS that there should be specific plan level standards created and additional guidance should be written for other state natural heritage areas lying in the matrix or interface. So we're not scratching our heads and running into a lot of problems when we're trying to do the assessment at the project level. Old growth, um, we want to place all known old growth and all old growth found during the plan implementation into the old growth patch network. Um, we saw the acreage about what we think the, the old growth acreage ought to be on these forests. Um, and so we, we want to maximize the planning for old growth. Um, specific plan level standards, again, and guidance um, going up higher in that funnel should be written for identified old growth patches included within matrix and interface management area. So when they're within the boundaries of a proposed project, there's guidance from the forest plan about how to handle that. Uh, to the highest degree possible and where feasible, uh, place existing old growth patches in, in backcountry or other management that protects their characteristics. Um, like I said, I left most of the difficult um, and, and meaty talk to, <laughs> to Sam and Josh. So I, I want to say that, um, that we have our contact information here. I'll come back to that in a minute. But Sierra Club has um, digital campaigns known as add up campaigns. And, and I want to leave this slide up for a minute and let you look at the, 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 um, the web address there of sc.org backslash NC Forest. And that will take you to our add up campaign. And if you haven't joined the campaign, please do so. We invite you to do so. Um, and like I say, all the points I just went over um, that, that are suggestions for comments that, that you can take advantage of. In other words, you don't have to start from scratch because we realize that a lot of you are not going to read this um, rather lengthy uh, forest plan. Um, but we do want you to know enough about it where you can comment and, and, and your talking points can be and should be customized in your own words with your message to add your personal perspective and why the forest is important to you. Um, if you use our add up campaign just because of the way that, that, that um, the online resources are structured, the Sierra Club can print and mail it for you or you can do that yourself. Um, so that's a real resource that we have for you is the add up campaign. Um, also, there are other ways to submit your comments. Of course, the FAR service has um, the online web portal. Um, and this is the way that has the official way for making online comments that the agency has put out there. And I'm sorry for the long address. I couldn't get to a shorter address that really took you specifically to Pisgah and Manahela but um, we can certainly uh, send this information uh, to you and it is on the Forest Services um, uh, Forest Revision um, website. Um, the, this is the site at the top um, and the official portal down is down here um, underneath number one. 
So you can just go to the Forest Service in North Carolina, their webpage, and get to the Forest Revision page, and you can submit your comments through that portal. Um, it's known as the CARA Public Comment Portal. I'll just kind of briefly show you what that looks like. Um, and um, you know you're there because you're right specifically at the Nantahalen Pisgah National Forest Plan Revision Site. Um, so let's see if I can get my slide back. Um, I also wanted to show you what our Add Up campaign looks like. So I'm sorry, when you, when you click, um, when you go to this web address, you'll see this um, web page and it'll be specific for the Nantahalen and Pisgah Pisgah, and you'll be able to sign up for the campaign, and then you'll be um, able to access our talking points there. Um, all, you know, always the snail mail is a possibility, and the Forest Service has given us a, um, a an address to send written comments to if you actually want to create your own comments and um, send them in through the old-fashioned mail. Um, so um, again, I want to give people uh, opportunity to ask some questions, and we'll we'll take some time at the end. I know we went through that rather rather quickly, but again, if you go to the Add Up campaign, those talking points will be there, and and a suggestion about a way you can construct your comments. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing there and see if we invite all the panelists to to join us and see if there's any. Uh, outstanding questions that we need to address. Does anybody want to take the hiking trail question? So there, yeah, there's a question on trails if folks aren't reading it. It says, what consideration is giving to hike, hiking trails in the plans? I was wondering if Sam Evans would be willing to to take that? And I'll, start. Not... I'll start, you fix it. How about uh, that? Um, yeah, I mean, there are a few things to think about when, as a hiker. Uh, one is what setting are you gonna be hiking in? I think that might be the most important for a lot of us. Um, <clears throat> if you're hiking through a backcountry area, it's gonna feel very different than if you're hiking through a, a, a matrix area. So the proportion of the trails that you enjoy that are allocated to those different management areas is going to make a big difference. And that changes quite a lot between different alternatives. So um, if we had specific trails, we could probably um, we could probably talk about that in more detail. I'm not sure that we'll have time to, to really dig into specific trails though on this webinar. Um, but the maps actually do a pretty good job of, of showing you where on the landscape. So if there's a different management areas would be located. Um, so setting is really important. I think if you just sort of generalize about uh, which alternative has the most uh, compatible with you know, sort of the natural hiking experience, um, quietness and solitude, that would be alternative C. Um, but again, you know, that, that, uh, that map for alternative C also comes with a big disclaimer that there's actually not a lot of wilderness recommended in alternative C. Um, there was, uh, there's, there's another related question that I think we'll tackle soon. The, uh, the other issue with trails that you'll want to be aware of is that there are different uh, frameworks for addressing whether we can have new trails on, on the, on the, between the alternatives. So uh, with one of the alternatives, uh, there is no limitation at all on new trails. With one of the alternatives, there is a cap. On, uh, on, on trails and, and it's pretty firm. And then there's another alternative where, uh, where we've got uh, the possibility of adding trails as we show progress towards sustainability. Um, so I think those, uh, those options are really pretty innovative. I think they need some, a little bit of work and they're the recreation groups that are participating in collaboratives um, are, are working really hard, I think, on, on providing some suggestions. But from what I know, the their other forests have never really um, come up with, their, the Manhill Pisco is calling it a trail bank. So as you sort of uh, decommission or, or fix uh, potentially 
um, problem trails in one area, you can sort of put a deposit in the bank that you can take out somewhere else um, and, and build a new trail. So that, that's a really innovative concept and one that could probably apply uh, equally to forest roads, um, which have similar sustainability and, uh, and, and maintenance backlog problems. So I think, I think it's a neat idea uh, that the Forest Service has thrown out to the public, this trail bank idea. Um, if, uh, if Heather is out there and wants to join us, I think it would be great if she could say some more about it. But. Uh, Heather has chimed in that she has a dysfunctional mic, so she will not be able to verbally chime in, but she did ask that you talk about this trail bank so you, you get an extra credit for doing what, what she wanted you to do without even seeing that, so good job. Uh, we got another question. Uh, uh, what rationale does the Forest Service give for the significant increase in the area available for timber harvest? And what groups are pushing for this increase? And I think I just want to qualify that question just a little bit. There's a table in the forest plan that shows the land available for timber harvest during, under the current forest plan and then under all the alternatives. And all of the alternatives have more land available for timber harvest than the current forest plan. That's partially an artifact of the of the inventoried roadless area rule that actually took some of the land that was available in the current forest plan and placed it in inventoried roadless areas. So I, I'm not sure that when the current forest plan was actually um, put into place in 1994 that there was that much of a difference between th then and now. But um, that's just a little qualification. But I guess in practical terms, there will be more under any alternative land available for timber harvest than is available in the current forest plan. So what's the rationale behind that and what groups are pushing for this increase? Anybody want to take that? Well, so Josh, you correct me if this is wrong. I think the, the rationale that I understand from the EIS is that it's needed to meet the objectives. That once you subtract the areas that aren't mature yet and aren't ready for harvest and the areas that are on steep slopes and the areas that might not have road access, in order to increase the amount of harvest that's happening, you kind of have to footprint uh, to get there. So I think the um, you know, we have this concept of tiered objectives in the new forest plan, where we're going to start with uh, more modest objectives that are based on um, our past experience with the capacity that we have. So the Forest Service knows that um, under uh, with its current capacity that it hasn't actually been able to meet the timber targets from the current plan. But, uh, you know, the, the, um, in the future, it hopes that it will have better capacity um, to, to get closer to those. And those timber targets are associated with wildlife habitat goals. Um, so the Forest Service believes that in order to meet the needs for some of the species on the national forest that um, uh, that it needs to increase the levels of timber harvest. And again, so increasing the levels of timber harvest, they also think requires um, increasing the footprint. There are a lot of assumptions built into that. I, I think, you know, one of the main ones is that, uh, that we can only create wildlife habitat in mature forest instead of maintaining it um, in places where it already exists. Um, but that is more commercial consideration than an ecological one. David, anything to add to that? I, no, I, I think, you know, I, I think that this is one of those balancing acts that we talked about with multiple use, sustained yield, and that, um, you know, we, we, we um, I, I think there's enough room to increase timber harvesting some, and I think we've all agreed to that with the diverse voices across, around the table in these collaborative things. So. Um, I think it's just one of those balancing acts that, that is required by forest planning that we'll have to look at and see how does that balance with what the other needs are on the forest and, and you know, come to a reasonable decision about it. Yeah, yeah, definitely one of the multiple uses that is uh, called out in the Multiple Use and Sustained Yield Act. I would say that some of the groups that are most uh, behind the increase in timber harvest tend to be wildlife groups as well as uh, the local timber industry. Um, you know, a lot of wildlife do right. benefit from the young forest habitat, and there is less now than there has been historically here. So uh, there's a, I think a, a demand for it. That's the main thing is let's do it where it's appropriate. Absolutely, and at levels that are appropriate. And yeah. I, I think that's one of the one of the things to get to. Uh, this is a great question because it is true that every alternative will provide more land for timber harvest than the current forest plan does. 
and partially because the way the management areas are being shifted around makes the land base a little more efficient for that or has the potential to make it more efficient for that so that the road system overlaps where the timber management can happen a little better and timber harvest is really dependent on roads. Um, I think the balancing act there is to make sure that with that increase potentially in uh, timber harvest and management that the sensitive areas are protected. And if, if both of those things can be accomplished, it's just a matter of uh, threading that needle. Right. I see we have a question about the craggy. Uh, are you optimistic that the National Scenic Area for the craggy area can be established? Um, I'll, I'll start, yeah, I'll start with that. Um, you know, the, uh, the National national Scenic Areas, and we have uh, several, I think, in the Southern Appalachian, the Mount Rogers area up in Virginia, um, and, and but, that, that creates a separate, that, that requires a separate act of Congress, of course, and I, it certainly helps to have the support of the Forest Service and the agency behind that, um, and it helps to have the support of elected officials and politicians, and this is where we have enthusiastic support from, from our county commissioners and our local elected officials um, within which the craggies and the Big Ivy area lies, and that's certainly very helpful. So I'm, I'm positive, even though um, it's going to take um, a, a national scenic area how that what that looks like and what can happen within there and exactly how you manage that has to be written to into each separate um piece of legislation that creates that national scenic area anybody want to add to that well i'll just say that i think the national scenic area vehicle really works well for craggy potentially because it is every piece of legislation is unique and so you can write into the to the bill all the unique things about the area that, that need special management and also national scenic areas have typically been designated based on their scenic value and the fact that the blue ridge parkway runs right through the area is, is clearly places a lot of scenic value and also biological values and so the craggy mountains are one of the premier uh you know biodiversity hot spots in the southern blue ridge so i think both of those um boxes get checked with the National Scenic Area uh, legislation. Um, we have a question, is there an effort for a coordinated response from the faith community? That's, that's an excellent question. I, I'm not sure how to answer that. And maybe somebody else has some insight into that. I can tell you that if your congregation is a member of the Creation Care Alliance, that the Creation Care Alliance uh, will be disseminating information on the forest plan and, and how to comment. Um, I know that a lot of congregations in Buncombe County, Henderson County, a little bit in Haywood and Madison are, are members of the Creation Care Alliance, I think. Um, uh, for instance, the, the venue where the Winoka group normally meets is a member of the Creation Care Alliance. But um, if, you're, if your congregation is not a member, I would look into joining Creation Care Alliance. Um, this is a long question. Let me see if I can read through it. We'll see who can answer it. Um, aren't wilderness areas designated more for in perpetuity basis than lands based for other types of management? If we have less wilderness and more areas designated for long-term management of old growth, as in option B, won't those old growth areas be open for timber cutting at a later date when the next management plan is written? as opposed to the wilderness areas, which would be more protected from harvest at the time of the next planning round. My concern here is with the long-term century level status of the forest. Very forward looking question. Um, I, 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 I answer, um, I mean, you know, obviously wilderness is designated by Congress. And so it has, as we've referred to the 1964 Wilderness Act and the Eastern Wilderness Act in 1975, but those pieces of legislation designate to the Forest Service how they are to manage those lands for their wilderness values. So in a sense, it does remove them from the future planning process um, in terms of once Congress has decided it's wilderness, then it's wilderness and future forest plans will not change that status. Um, Josh or Sam, you wanna add anything to that? Um, yeah, I think spot on. Uh, yeah, that's spot on. I mean, wilderness is the most permanent of the designations. Old growth is not as permanent, uh, but it, and yeah, it just, it all depends. Not not every area is, is is suitable for wilderness designation. You can see that in the draft alternatives, right? Because the designated wilderness that Congress has designated uh, shows up as wilderness in every single alternative. It's not an option to manage it any other way. Uh, 
what we're commenting to the Forest Service on right now, though, is uh, are, are administrative decisions, not congressional decisions. So we're asking the Forest Service to recommend areas for wilderness or to, on its own, of its own initiative, um, include areas in the old growth patch network. So those are less durable decisions than, by, by their very nature, than uh, a congressional designation. But they are, they, they do have some strings attached. So if you recommend an area as wilderness or if you, um, or, or if you include an area in your old growth patch network, you have to have a pretty good reason to change that in the future. So it's not that you can't do it, uh, but the, you can't just do it arbitrarily. Um, old growth, of course, takes uh, on the order of centuries to restore. And so if you're uh, including an area in an old growth patch, um, because you're, that's part of your strategy for restoring old growth on the centuries long plan, um, then it would be arbitrary to, to pull it out and swap, you know, substitute a younger stand for it in the future, right? Like that would be something that would be illegal because the, the federal agencies can't act arbitrarily. Looks like we've got one more question, um, and then we'll we're going to wrap it up and turn it back over to Judy for the for the big wrap up. Um, they want to know what effect will the proposed logging have on camping and hiking? Um, and so I'll let one of you two start off with the answer to that because I think it's one of those it depends kind of things. But yes, it depends. Um... The plan doesn't, doesn't direct any specific areas to be logged. It says where that's a possibility and where it's not a possibility. And so what I think we've seen in the past 20 years or so is that it's pretty infrequent for logging to uh, impact a hiking trail or a camping area, although it does happen. There was a, a, a pretty infamous event up back around 2008 or nine where uh, the Bartram Trail was used as a skid trail when you know logs were being hauled down the, the trail that people were hiking on um, in, in Macon County. Um, but uh, you know it really does depend. It depends on the standards and guides in the forest plan. It depends on the management areas that the trails and the camping areas end up in. Um, I think most likely the answer is very little effect uh, for most places, but uh, you can't say none. Uh, you sure can't say none un until you see the ink dry on the plan. So I want to turn it back to, over to Judy, um, the chair of the local Winoka group of the Sierra Club, to for the big wrap up. And, um, but on my part, I want to before I mute, I want to thank all the panel, the other two panelists, and all the participants for their attention and their questions. Uh, Western North Carolina Sierra Club, I want to give a heartfelt thank you to an excellent presentation. Sam from Southern Environmental Law Center, Josh from Mountain True, David from our forest group in Sierra Club. And I want to let you know, again, we are looking at continuing our online monthly meetings and have scheduled already our next meeting, which is, again, the first Thursday, May 7th at 7 p.m. for wildflowers. It is the time for wildflowers in our beautiful, beautiful mountains. We want to invite everyone tonight, everyone across the state and other states, but certainly those of us in Western North Carolina, to come and listen to Scott Dean, naturalist and storyteller, see beautiful pictures, see some critters, see some trees. You need to advance register as you did for tonight. The link is already posted on our website, which is Sierra Club, Western North Carolina. So thank you, thank you to all, to all, thank you.